So in the New Testament, you do have grace. In the Old Testament, it's looked very differently. There is grace in the Old Testament, but judgment comes in a very different kind of way. You have Jesus Christ on the cross, so now all of a sudden you do get way more language of heaven and hell. And if a person decides to fall on the grace of the cross of Jesus Christ and believe and grow in a trusting relationship with him, now you go to heaven. But if you say, no, I'm gonna reject that and go my own way, no matter what, well now eternal damnation comes into play. So there is more grace in the New Testament, but also the consequences potentially are way stronger in the New Testament than the Old. There's a lot of disagreement between Christians and Christians on what the Bible means by a specific passage and even like Christians and Muslims. Yeah. So my question is, how do we have an easier time believing that the Bible is divinely inspired? I don't think you have an easy time believing that any book is the Word of God. Instead, you have to ask yourself, is the manuscript evidence there? Is the literary style there? that you can trust the Quran simply as history. And I think it is. I think there really was a man named Muhammad who lived from about 570 to 632 AD. And obviously he taught a lot of things and he did a lot of things. And I think we got a pretty accurate record of it. And unquestionably, there's evidence that Jesus Christ lived, taught, died, and rose from the dead. And we read that in the gospels. Then the next question is, okay, does the evidence support Muhammad being a reliable source of information about God? Or does the historical evidence point to Jesus Christ being a reliable source of information about God? And for me, sir, that's a no-brainer. Why? Because when you read the Quran, you see how much respect Muhammad had for Jesus. And obviously, I applaud that. But then repeatedly in the Quran, Muhammad says, Jesus is not God. Jesus is not God. And eventually you get the point. Muhammad believed that Jesus was a great prophet, that he was not God. But when you go to the Gospels, written by guys who saw Jesus, who knew the eyewitnesses, they insist Jesus claimed to be God. So you've got this fundamental contradiction between Muhammad and Jesus. And that fundamental contradiction is, who is Jesus? Just a good prophet? Or is he God in human form? Does that make any sense? I, I was more like wondering about the disagreements between Christians, each other, than Muslims. Well, that's easy. Christians struggle with pride. Christians struggle with being opinionated. And so I'll say, I think this passage means that, and Stuart will say, I disagree. I think it means this. And if we don't watch out, we'll say goodbye to each other. And that's sad. Jesus prayed, I pray, Father, that the believers would be one, united, so that the world might know that you had sent me. You know something? If you're a Catholic on this campus who believes in Jesus, or if you're a Protestant on this campus who believes in Jesus, you are brothers and sisters in Christ. And to get all honked off over the fact that, oh, well, you're a Catholic and you respect the Pope and I'm a Protestant, I don't respect the Pope like you do, therefore, goodbye, we'll see you later. No, it's not the issue. Here's the real issue. The majority of Catholics that I know don't believe in Jesus. They believe in a ritual. And guess what? The majority of Protestants that I know don't believe in Jesus. They believe in a good old boy's religion called the American flag, apple pie, and Jesus. It all goes together. No, it doesn't. Sorry, Jesus was not wrapped in an American flag and laid in a NICU be bed. No, he's wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger. And he didn't start the Republican Party and he didn't start the Democratic Party either. He talked about the kingdom of God. And therefore, if you put your faith in Christ, you're my brother, whether you're Catholic, Protestant or whatever. Now, if you deny the deity of Christ, then you're not my brother in Christ, because you're denying who Christ really is. And I've got a boatload of Catholic friends who really believe in Jesus, and I've got a boatload of Protestant friends who really believe in Jesus. It's simply not the issue. But when we focus on the minors, 
We tend to divide. Let's focus on the majors. Well, what are the majors? Well, just look at Mark Twain. Mark Twain said, it ain't the parts of the Bible I don't understand that disturb me. It's the parts of the Bible I do understand that disturb me. On the basics, the Bible's all too clear. Now, are there difficult passages? Yes, sir, and you've alluded to that fact, and you're absolutely right. But let's not let those differences divide us. Thank you. Yes, sir. So with that being said, do you believe in agnostic Christianity, or do you think those are two conflicting terms? Good question. So, Stuart, yeah. you deal with the agnostic. Well, what's your de- I've heard multiple definitions. What's your definition of agnostic Christianity? I'll just use, like, so, like, I'll just use the base definition. You know, when you're agnostic of something, you know, you're not very sure. Right. But the thing is that how Christianity is defined is that you must have full faith in God, right? But the thing is that someone says they're an agnostic theist or an agnostic Christian, right? That means they're, they have some faith in God, but they're not sure. Yeah. But then, you know, some interpretations of the Bible offer that you have full faith or you have none. So that's why I'm asking you, do you think they can conflict? Or do you think an agnostic Christian is a thing, or are those terms just too colliding based off of the interpretation of the Bible? Yeah, I would say don't get too caught up in semantics because the Bible encourages doubt. That's the strange thing. See, a lot of people will say, for example, on, on the, here's another form of it. A lot of people would say you get in through the pearly gates by becoming a more authentic human being. So Caitlyn Jenner said this. She said that I need to find my true self. I'm not sure what it is, I'm agnostic. But when I do, if I do, find my true self, then God will let me in. So to Christianity, David is doubting nonstop. Job, especially when they're going through suffering, Job is doubting nonstop. God encourages it almost, it seems like. He says, he allows Job to say everything he wants, blasts him, and then eventually corrects him and says, who created this whole place? Who allows the rain? Who brings the rain to come? But David in Psalm 88 and 39, he says, death is my only friend. He says, get away from me, God. And God doesn't correct him for that. God doesn't say you're a horrible sinner, rotten sinner for doubting me. No, he understands how we speak when we are desperate and he allows it. Even the doubting, see, see, when I debate atheists, they'll say, oh, look at doubting Thomas. Jesus comes in and says, you cannot doubt because he says, stop doubting Thomas and believe. What they miss is, rewind the tape a little bit. He'd spoken with the disciples. The disciples gave him all the evidence he could have possibly wanted. Seemed like to me at least, but he still wanted more. It was the stubborn type of doubting that kept going and Jesus eventually says, look, I'm here physically, what more do you want? Now stop doubting and believe. So if any Christian comes to you and says, no, you can never doubt, you can never have questions, I don't know what book they're reading. At the same time though, God does call us to frequently say, come and trust me more. Come and have a relationship with me. But it's always that first step that you're taking towards God. That is what the, where the real approval and love is wooing you. He's the hound of heaven saying, continue to come. And yet it's grace upon grace in terms of what that timing may look like. In regards to like atheism, what if you grew up in a household that was subjected to those teachings and you never got those teachings that you're speaking about? So let's say they subjected you to believe that he really isn't there. So you proceed, you know, to punch him. So do you get held at the same judgment level? Do you get deemed you know, differently if you were never subjected to the teachings that you're describing? No. Jesus clearly says in Luke 12, to that person who's been given much, much will be required. From the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. So no, we're not all gonna be judged the same. I have a younger brother who transplants kidneys and livers at Duke University Hospital up in Durham, North Carolina. He's far more intelligent than I'll ever be. And we have a younger sister who has special needs. She's 59 years old and she's at about a third grade educational level. Is God gonna hold us all responsible in the same way? No, because God is all knowing. He will judge us fairly, uniquely, according to what we have, not according to what we don't have. Does that make sense? Let's say the atheist household, this individual was abiding by all the rules of that household, but it wasn't by you know, the Bible or anything, you know, that Christianity goes by. Yep. Will God hold them, you know, at the same same level by them abiding by those rules and the subjective teachings that they were, you know, taught? No, God will hold each of us uniquely responsible. The only reason an atheist does not find God is for the same reason that a criminal does not find the police. They're running away. So to say, I don't believe that God exists because I grew up in an atheist home. Sorry, that doesn't cut it. Why? 
because God loves you and by his Holy Spirit, he's reaching deep within you to draw you to himself. So to be an atheist is inexcusable in light of all the evidence through nature, through human experience that God has given us. Well, what about Jesus Christ? Well, if you hear about Christ and if you wanna know God, the lights are gonna go on and you're gonna say, wow, this Jesus is true, he is reliable. But what about if you've never heard about Christ? How's going to God going to judge you? I do not know. I do know he'll be just and fair, compassionate, merciful, but exactly how he holds people responsible who've never heard about Christ, I really don't know. In the beginning, I, the gospel said that God created humans in the image of him. But to my impression, when he does that, the image of God is, is he's uncorruptible can't corrupt him and he's omnipotent. But then later on, we get corrupted with sin. So does that make it so that we weren't really made in the image of God if we were corrupted like that? Or is it the other way around? Okay, good. What you gotta do is you gotta define image of God. Yeah. All right? God is all powerful. Yeah. I'm created in the image of God. It doesn't mean I'm all powerful. God is all knowing. I'm created in the image of God. That doesn't mean I'm all knowing. Do I have some power? Yes. Do I have some knowledge? Yes. God is omnipresent. Does that mean because I'm created in his image that I'm omnipresent? No. I am present in Jacksonville, Florida, not in New York City where I live, in that area. So what does it mean to be created in the image of God? It means that you have a conscience. You can distinguish between good and evil, right and wrong, and God is holy and just, and you reflect that with your conscience. You can distinguish between the two. It means you can love. God is love. And you have, and every atheist friend of mine and every agnostic friend of mine has the ability to love. Why? Because we're not matter and energy evolved to our order. We're human beings created in the image of God. You and I have the ability of self-reflection. Yes. Tonight you can sit on the corner of your bed and say, when I said that, that was good. When I said that, that was wrong. You can self-reflect. I do the same thing every night almost, okay? So that means we have a will and God has a will. And so a Christian is someone who's learning to submit their will to God's will, which is not easy. Very hard for me, very hard. Okay, so that's what we mean when we say image of God. Like part of him, we're made from parts of him. Certain, no, 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 I'm not part of God. I'm a human being with my own individuality, my own personality. God is a separate being who I either choose to live in relationship with okay. or not to live in relationship with. Wow. Stuart, how do you explain the image of God? Well, we have characteristics. When we reflect, it's, it's like a mirror, right? Yeah. It's a reflection in such a way where God does imbue us with a desire to love, a desire to sacrifice. Yeah. I mean, where does that desire come from? That's very strange from an evolutionary perspective. Sacrificing for all people groups? Yeah. That doesn't make any sense. Maybe your own tribe, I can yeah. see that. But actually sacrificing for another tribe could be seen as selfish because you're hurting your own tribe. Oh. And so that's one big, th those are two crucial ones that we reflect God in that kind of way. I think we reflect God also in our desire to forgive. I know it can be hard, but I think all of us would say forgiveness is tremendously important. Yeah, yeah. I think another way we reflect God is in our desire to be compassionate, is in our desire to show pity. Okay. Nietzsche himself said, the grossest thing in this world is pity. Don't pity somebody else. Don't show sympathy and empathy. It's all about power. It's all about power, dominance. Yeah. Well, no, that, that's not reflecting the image of God because you look at the cross of Christ, talk about empathy, sympathy, getting on our level and even be, being willing to die for us. That is who God well, is. I have a follow-up question now that you said that. So if an atheist or agnostic or someone that doesn't know Christianity, like just loves someone other people, love. you know, exhibits love to others, does that mean they're doing, like, does that mean God, part of God, like the characteristics, are they still like mirroring that or is it just completely separate? Yes. You, know, you understand what Beautiful I'm saying? Beautiful question. That's why Nietzsche and other atheistic philosophers yeah. said that if you live in those way, the characteristics yeah. we just talked about, you're actually being a Christian, uh, but you say you're an atheist. That makes a lot of sense. You say you're an atheist. That's yeah. why somebody like Jordan Peterson comes along and picks up that type of thinking and says, all of our truth here in the US, we're just connected to a deeper truth. 
because we all long for, look at what we do for so, you know, social justice. Okay. Look at how we live for each other. Look at how we show different type of virtues that are connected to the Judeo-Christian faith yeah. out of the Bible. And so we're all connected in that type of way. That's why when somebody like Dostoevsky says, if there is no God, all is permissible, do what you want. Always atheists say, that is so offensive. You're yeah. telling me I don't believe in God, so I go out and do whatever I want? No, that's not what Dostoevsky is saying. Yeah. He's saying atheist Christians all live ethically equivalent lives at times, similarly, all can do good and bad. But if you truly buy into the philosophy of life, and you're gonna be honest that there is no God, no moral obligation, then why not steal when nobody's looking? Okay. Why not? Oh, because we all want to work together for the betterment of the life here on earth. Yeah. Please, <laughs> please. Okay. That, that is a ridiculous type of thinking. Yeah. So. so is it technically possible to live the way of God without really fully accepting him, open arms through your heart, and still getting salvation? Is that a thing? Mm. So it's like I can, you know, I could live away, donate, go to charity, live the way he wants me to, but I don't, I don't have a relationship with him. Mm -hmm. But I'm still doing what he wants me to do. Yeah. Mm. So does that give me salvation, or does that yep. not give me salvation? What does that get me? Right. So the Pharisees were known to have tithed more than any other groups yeah. that were connected to Christ at times. At times. It yeah. wasn't like every Pharisee was tithing more than every yeah, Christian. Yeah, yeah, but they were known to tithe a lot. They were known to live out social justice in a fairly consistent way. Really? And yet what happened? What? Their hearts were far from him, far from Jesus Christ. So another example you get, don't pray on the street corner and babble like the pagans. Yeah. But what does babbling mean? It means I'm gonna disregard God and I'm just gonna show I'm holy and self-righteous to the world by what I do. Babbling, speaking many different words in prayer. And babbling means you're just talking to God, yeah. not listening uh, from him. One way. That's what babbling means in the Greek there. Exactly, okay. it's one way. So, if you're close, what Christ is gonna judge you on is ultimately fully coming to him, losing yourself, and falling upon his grace and his love okay. rather than restraining and say, I'm going to live for me, I'm going to be self-absorbed your question becomes very difficult yeah. in semantics, but also in terms of the judgment. Ultimately, I am not God. I, I would not want to answer that question in an authoritative kind of way, because yeah. only God is going to know whether you are truly seeking after him or not. But you're going to have many opportunities. Okay. Think about Romans chapter one. Paul says only eventually did God give them over okay. to their desires. Even the Canaanites in the Old Testament, 400 years to repent and to come to know God. Okay. Or Jeremiah chapter 2, for example. They, God continually came back and saved them even when they were living for idols. And yet eventually it was very similar to Romans chapter 1, yeah. even there in the Old Testament. He gave them over to their desires okay. to live for things like money, sex, and power. Okay. Because I'm just wondering, like, you could, I, I was, like, worried, like, you can live, like, maybe don't accept God into your heart. Like, you can live a good life, be good, but then doesn't get accepted in the heaven. That's kind of, like, yeah. so then, like, what is that? So, like, does that make it so all the good I've done in my life is kind of pointless? You know what I mean? Interesting point. You see what I mean? Yep. That's a very interesting point. So, typically, those who are genuinely going after people yeah. to help them, the Good Samaritan, who was willing to get down and potentially get killed in order to save somebody who was completely ethnically different from yeah. him, completely hated. We don't even realize the type of division and hatred between Jews and Samaritans in that day. Yeah. It was incredible. Really? And yet he was willing to get down and clean out his cuts. I mean, I would say that's pretty genuine, especially okay. when nobody else was looking. But what if you do that without like the love of God in your heart? Like, right. does that make it even? Does that make it worse? Like, is it better to do good with the love of your God? You know. Well, if you're honest with me right now, and I'm honest with you yeah. right now, I'm pretty sh sure we can go in to a soup kitchen and say, "Hey, I'm doing this to impress the people around me, and I'm doing it so I can get it on my resume, so yeah. I can get into UNF." versus I'm going to do it for them because I love them because it reflects back to the image of God okay. how God loves me. I, mean, I don't think it gets that subject, I mean, uh, objective, right? Excuse, excuse me, I don't think it gets that subject, I don't think there's well, levels there. Well, because the way you make it say is that I'll only love someone yeah. if it's through God. Like, I won't be able to love other people if it's not through no, God. No, 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 yeah, no. The way you describe that kind of makes sure. it Sure, okay, like well, I, I rescind that statement. Okay, okay. God you uses me? King Cyrus, for example, yeah. in the Old Testament, Definitely King Cyrus did not believe in God. Okay. And yet God actually used him to do good in his kingdom. Okay. So the, the righteousness falls on the unrighteous and the righteous. 
And so God uses those who are non-believers to do good things, to do good works. But don't forget, to your tough question again, in terms of that partial restraint, yeah. if we partially restrain ourselves, is that somehow going to send us to hell? No, all of us are partially restraining ourselves. Let's be real here. Yeah. Every time we sin, that's doubting God's goodness, that's doubting his power. Okay. See, people oftentimes don't agree with that. But yeah. I, I think if we're honest, no. When I purposely go and sin, I am doubting that God, you know, I'll, I'll fall on cheap grace. I can do this, he'll forgive me. Yeah. Or I'll, I'll do this, God's not that, I mean, he, he's not that omniscient, he's not that all-knowing. Yeah. So that, that's a big piece to it. Okay, I got it. I mean, the thief on the cross on the other side of Christ, I, I think he probably was still restraining a little bit. Okay, he, okay. He's spoken yeah. of in very flowery terms, but this guy was most likely a murderer. Yeah. So when he says, don't insult the Son of Man, we are talking to actually God right here. Yeah. Yes, he's giving his life up, and Jesus says, I will, today I will see you in paradise. Yeah. And yet, I, I promise you, that, that murderer is not all of a sudden perfectly good yeah, in his I heart, right? That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Thank you. Good know. question, absolutely. To that, with the murder on the cross, is that to the same logic of like, you can live a terrible life according to the world and like you can murder, steal, rape, all these things. And then five minutes before you die, you say, okay, God is the God, that is the only way. And I'm gonna choose to do that. And then you die. How does that make sense? Like, And that right there is one of the toughest questions because it gets back to grace. Every single religion and worldview, the meritocracy we live in, is we need to work to God. We need to work to somehow provide for our families. A lot of that is good, right? But grace is God is working to us. He is the hound of heaven constantly going after us because he loves us. And so all of us here on this campus, we want first, second, third opportunities to do it right. When we offend a girlfriend, a boyfriend, when we offend a friend, when we make a big mistake, everybody makes accidents. Who does not want somebody to say, I forgive you? You're a human, you're fallible. We all want that. And so that type of grace writ large is what God offers us. Jesus Christ offers us on the cross. So even a deathbed conversion, somebody who was part of the mafia, if he fully turns his life over to Christ, then yes, Christ says, today you will be with me in paradise. That's why I'll give you another example. This woman, her last name, her last name's um, escaping me right now, but she was on death row in Texas for something like 15 to 20 years. She had pickaxed her boyfriend who ended up in bed with a random woman. She had pickaxed both of them to death. Okay, she goes to jail. She's on death row. She's getting interviewed by ABC News. And you can see just in this, these interviews, 10 years after the event, you can see a woman who is chasing after God and who is asking for genuine forgiveness. And then what happens? Well, she gets the electric chair. Okay, I don't know where you fall politically on that, but it's not that, it's not that the Bible says that there's no death penalty, but the point is, is that that woman, I believe, deserved a second chance. Still, still punishment, some type of punishment, but you look at a, a, a case like that, and that's what God offers us, where it's you're never too far gone, but in our culture today, it's cancel them. They are too far gone. He slipped up and said a certain word that's offensive. She did too. Cancel them, they're done. Nobody truly wants that, do they? Because then they're gonna have to cancel themselves if they're honest. Yeah, how can you trust the grace? Because if he's saying that that grace is the thing that gives you eternal life, how can you trust that it's going to give you eternal life? Because of what he has done in terms of dying on that cross for us, when we look at that type of action, now we can say he judges hearts. He looks at hearts. That's why throughout the New Testament, you get he is looking at hearts. He's discerning hearts of the Pharisees, for example. So we can trust it by falling on what he did on the cross and saying, God, I don't, I don't feel it right now. See, our culture is all about feelings, right? No, Christianity is not about feelings. That's a byproduct of using your reason, using your will to say, God, I want to trust you. The, the, the motivations could be sinful right now, the emotions, I definitely don't feel it, but I wanna take the action of stepping towards you, speaking to you, reading my Bible, getting involved in a student organization, going to church, really going after you, then we trust him there to say, hey, you want a relationship with me? I want a relationship with you. You have eternal life. Why would God um, 
not present himself at the beginning to every single people group on the earth? Why would he choose one family in the Middle East and then expand that from there? I do not know why when God chose to become a human being, he became a Jew. But I do know that God has revealed himself to every single human being on the planet. Every single one of us has a mind, a rational mind. We can look at the evidence of creation and say there's got to be an intelligent mind behind it. Anthropology shows us that every type, every culture has some type of religion. So we as human beings are incurably religious. That is why I'm convinced the only reason you can say there is no God is because you're running away. God has left more than enough evidence for any thinking human being to believe he exists. And the proof of that is anthropology. Study every culture around the world. Every culture has some type of religion, some type of belief in God or gods. Why does it take blood or sacrifice from God to make things right? Why, why, does it, why is it that extreme? Why can't he just make things right? Blood is symbolic. It represents life. You lose all your blood, you're not going to be sucking wind five minutes later. So, the penalty for sin, according to God, according to the judge of the universe, is death. Therefore, when Christ gives his blood, he's giving his life. He's laying his life down as a sacrifice to pay the penalty for our wrongdoing. Well, who's he paying? An angry God? No. Jesus was not paying an angry God. There's no third party. That's why the analogy gets difficult about ransom and redemption. It's me and God. I have rebelled against God. God becomes a human being in Christ and pays the ransom, not to a third party. He absorbs the hit in his body, sacrificing his life, Jesus does, for me. A guy's in a raft. All of a sudden, they begin to realize they're out in the middle of the ocean. This raft is not going to make it. One of us has to get out of the raft. So the guy makes a decision. I will get out of the raft, and he has hypothermia in the northern Atlantic Ocean and dies. And someone says, he paid a high price to save those people's lives. Well, who did he pay? He didn't pay anybody. That expression means he sacrificed his life so that the other people in the raft could live. See, so that's why some of these concepts are hard and the challenge is to think clearly through them. I'd like to invite you to Grace Community Church located at 365 Lukeswood Road in New Canaan, Connecticut. Our services are at 9.30 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. on Sundays. Hope you can join us.